Hello, everyone. Welcome to Ready to Scale. And today we have yet another special edition session where I'm going to talk about what I see in the market, kind of tips and a lot of kind of interesting information um, from my point of view, from my experience as a sponsor. For those of you who don't know, I'm Ellie Perlman, and I'm a syndicator and an operator, and I own over 2,000 units across the U.S., all multifamily in Texas, Florida, Georgia. And what I want to talk to you today about is the July market update. And I've been talking about what's happening in the market every month since COVID started, and I'm giving some insights of what's happening behind the scenes and what I see in my properties and what I see in the market. And I want to kind of address the changes that we've been seeing during July. So I'm going to start with what's happening in our properties and then kind of talk about what I see in the market. So our properties basically, for the most part, have been performing and we see an increased demand for properties. We see an increased food traffic. And by food traffic, I mean we have a lot more potential tenants actually going to see units, calling, signing on leases. I think the initial shock that started in March and April where we actually, we didn't see much foot traffic. It was mainly renewals. Right now we see a lot more demand. A lot more people are moving. They're not afraid to move, um, you know, and, and look for a new apartment. And so We've seen that trend starting a little bit in May and June picked up. And in July, we've seen, you know, a lot more traffic, a lot more demand to our properties, which leads me to the next thing that I want to share with you is that we actually started pushing rents on renewals between, you know, it was 0% during March, April, May, because we didn't want to lose those tenants. And we said, hey, if you renew your lease right now, we're not going to increase your rents at all. We're going to keep it at 0% because we wanted to make sure that we're at, um, as you know, we're high when it comes to the occupancy. The occupancy is high as much as possible because we weren't sure how easy or difficult or challenging it would be to bring new tenants. So now that we see that our properties are, you know, pretty much there. Some of them are full. Some of them are 93, 94, 97% occupied. Now we said, hey, we understand what's happening. We know how to manage assets during COVID. And now we're going to start as we have more and more demand and more people are showing up and looking for an apartment. So now we feel comfortable increasing the renewal rents by 4%. And we said, let's test it out and see how tenants are going to react to that. And so because we take care, we could take good care of our properties, some tenants were surprised by the increase because they've expected it to be at 0% like everyone else is doing, but we actually got very little pushback and we're still maintaining between 60 and 80% renewal rate, even when we increase rents by 4%. And that's the normal renewal um, increase even before COVID. And we started it with the property, the properties that are 100%, we have one property that is 100% occupied, we have a wait list, and we've been pushing rents now on renewals by 4%. Because even if someone says no, then we know that we can bring someone else who would be willing to pay the higher price. Um, and so that's what we've been doing, basically 4%, 3% increases on renewals. And we're also doing renovation on demand. I'm not going to talk about it because I've, I've been explaining that and talking about it in, you know, during, in, in multiple uh, sessions, solo episodes. But you know, basically, we've been getting anywhere between 10 to 28.5% rent increases when we just renovate the units that, um, you know, after we, we make sure that someone actually wants to renovate a unit and then we just go ahead and renovate the, the, um, the apartment. And so we, the, the change in July is that we actually started increasing rents on renewals because we knew that most likely either the tenants are going to stay and pay the extra 4%, 3%, or that they are going to um, 
you know, to leave, but it will be easy for us to bring someone else because demand is so high. Now, the last thing that I would say about our properties is that um, I think collections were very high, partially because our tenants are, those who lost their jobs are getting unemployment benefits and the stimulus checks definitely help. Uh, there's not much to do outside and spend your money. Uh, you know, nobody's going to Italy. And so uh, you don't really have a lot of chances to spend the money that you have. So paying rent would probably be first. And some investors voice their concern about, hey, what's going to happen once unemployment you know, benefits are going to end? And every state is basically different. I can tell you that Florida and Georgia, those are the, the, the and Texas actually, the states that we're investing in, at least some of them are extending the, the state unemployment benefits. So some states are extending the benefits, the unemployment benefits by 13 months, and some even extended it, you know, by more than that. And that definitely is going to help our tenants pay the rents. And some of them even included extra $600 in their state level unemployment benefit. And so basically what we've seen in our properties is, you know, during July an increased demand for our, for our uh, units and increasing food traffic, rents are increasing, unemployment is still continuing and helping our tenants pay their rents. Now, what, we, what I see in the market um, is a bit different. So there's a little bit more deals than in June and in May, but not as much. And there's still that gap between sellers and buyers expectations, as, ex as I explained before in previous solo episodes, that basically when it comes to the buyers, they expect to see reduction in price because they're taking up bigger risk because there's unknown component that has to be priced in every deal. But sellers are saying, hey, our properties are 95% occupied. Our collections are high. There's no real reason to lower the prices, which is not really true because there's still uncertainty. The fact that things have been going pretty well now doesn't mean that they're going to go well in the next year or so. And the, the lenders are not giving us the same great terms that they were willing to give us prior to COVID and that impacts the prices. So what I see right now is the deals that are closed or closing are they usually either at pre-COVID prices, which is unbelievable, or with a modest one to 3% um, price adjustment. And so there's some of, some of them are trending around that, but I haven't seen any deal with 10%, 15%, price cuts. It just, it just doesn't happen. And, you know, I have to say that the fact that the prices are still stable, that speaks to how solid and how safe and re recession resilient multifamily is that the prices, the valuation doesn't drop as much even during a pandemic, which is something to think about. Now, the deals that are still going through the process is pretty fast. So before COVID, usually if you wanted to put your Asset in the market, it takes between six and 12 months from the moment you start working on it until you actually close the deal and, and money exchanges hands. Now, even with marketed deals, brokers are saying, we're not going to have a four-week process where everyone needs, they have two to three weeks to review the documents and the financials. They have to submit an offer. Then we select buyers for the second round of best and final. And then there's there, there's um, another bidding process. So this whole process actually shrinks because in my opinion, it's because brokers understand that things are changing so quickly. They don't want to jeopardize it. Now that people and buyers are willing to buy again, they want to capture the moment. They want to make sure that this stays in kind of um, the, the same, you know, the, the same state of mind remains. And so whenever there's a deal, they tell you, Hey, you have two weeks and two weeks, just give us your best price. And this, and, and that's it. And the seller's going to choose a, uh, a buyer to award a deal to. So the process have been compressed timeline wise. And, um, that's it, almost like how an off market deal kind of, um, transacts in the market. So, you know, that's what we see. We see more deals, maybe not as much as pre-COVID, 
Um, but every month you have more and more sellers that are willing to put their deals in the market and you have more, a little bit more buyers that are interested in buying. Now, the buyers that are actually playing in a sandbox right now, they're not the big players, the institutional funds. They're still sitting on the sidelines. Um, they're more risk averse and they also don't like to buy value add deals. They don't like to do the work. They don't have that, those skills or they're not interested in doing that. And still today, the value comes from value add, from being able and willing to take a property, improve it, and then sell it at a higher price. And this is how you make money. At least that's what I do. And it's been working great for me. And the returns, pre-COVID, the returns for non-value add deals were all were already, the returns were already, you know, pretty, pretty low compared to a value add deal that right now with all the uncertainty, those returns are not there. So many institutionals are not willing to buy anything right now. It's just the deals just don't pan out and they don't work as well. And so that's kind of what we see in the market. So I think there's a good opportunity for someone that is for a company that is willing to buy, I would say anywhere between 30 to 60, $70 million. That's, there's a lot of opportunity right now because there aren't many companies that are, that can buy those, you know, size of properties, size of deals. A lot of institutionals that were playing in that sandbox are not playing right now. So there's more opportunities to step in and actually purchase a property. And that's, that's what we do. We are in, I would say in the 20 to 50, $55 million um, uh, scale. And so deal size and the bigger the deal, the, the deal, the higher is our chance to actually get the deal. Because when it comes to a $20 million deal, there might be three, four, five other companies like us that are able to close that deal. When it comes to 50, $60 million deals, then the list kind of is getting thinner and thinner. And um, a lot of the original players are not playing in that field anymore. So that's kind of our focus at Blue Lake. So, you know, we're trying to target those bigger, larger deals because it, we're more likely to get it and not have to get into a bidding war against another player because most of those players are not playing right now. That's, that's it. That's what I have for today. Just wanted to give you a little bit of uh, kind of, you know, open the door a little bit and show you and explain to you what is happening from the sponsor's point of view in our properties, in the market. So I'm going to continue doing that. I'm going to continue recording one episode where I'm going to basically interview a guest. And then the second one, the, the next day would be just recording the things that I want to share with you, what I see in the market, and hopefully that will, you know, give you some value. If you're a syndicator or a sponsor, you might find some value in the way that and how we run things and the insights that we have. And if you're a passive investor, that gives you a good background about what's happening in the market, but also kind of opens the door to show you what's happening a little bit behind the scenes. And so you're better in a better position to make a decision when you see a deal, when you know what to ask, knowing what you know now. Um, that's everything. That, that's all. That's all I have for today. Be bold, be great, and keep moving forward.